Dr. Denise Bjorkman remembers Gavin Watson as a visionary and a driven personality. Bjorkman is a practicing health practitioner who spent 15 years working as an external vendor supplying services to Busasa, now known as African Global Operations. Services included coaching, referrals to hospitals and mental health evaluations for the company's personnel. Her practice would see an average of around about a thousand staff members per annum in a company which at some stage had an average of 4,000 staff members. Uh, Dr. Bjorkman joins us now via hybrid just to have a quick chat. Good to have you on the line. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Leanne. How, how did you receive Watson's death? How did I, sorry, I missed that. How, how did you receive Watson's death? How did you hear about Watson's death? Um, when I heard it yesterday, this was a tragedy. He was a larger-than-life personality. Everybody knew him and everybody loved him. Well, I won't say everybody. There were two campuses in, at the Sasa, but he had a huge following and people were very loyal to him. Yeah. His character, you, you describe him as larger-than-life. Can you give us a little bit more about what he was like as a person? Um, he, he, lived, he was a role model. He really walked the talk, exceptionally well-dressed. He, he bore himself extremely well. Um, he, his dress was exceptional. His shirts were always pleated. He liked expensive shoes. He's, he had a very booming voice, and you could hear him from the top of the campus all the way down. Um, very commanding in his personality, and he would let you know exactly what he thought. Didn't have much tact, but he would... Uh, discuss openly with you anything that he wanted to discuss, no matter who was there. Yeah. Your kind of interactions with him, obviously we've described you as a, as a health practitioner, uh, different, different kinds of services, coaching, referrals to hospital, mental health evaluations. What was your sort of engagement and relationship with, with him? Well, we saw him on a regular basis. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. He would come down to our unit we, he, one of the things that he believed in was a wellness unit for his staff. He really believed in his staff. Many people believed that he ran a cult. I disagree with that. There were, there were a couple of cultish elements within the company um, because he commanded this, this incredible loyalty. And there were certain rituals that took place, like offering Holy Communion and having prayer meetings on a regular basis. But apart from that, the staff were free to act and behave and believe the way they wanted to, providing Christianity was at the center of everything. Hmm. Offering Holy Communion, that's quite an interesting one. So was that, was that a daily occurrence? Because we did hear about these prayer meetings and that they, they did take place every single morning. Is that, is that when they, the communion was handed out? Well, usually there were prayer meetings every morning from 6 to 8. Staff were free to attend. It was a very flat organization. And uh, anyone, as I say, anyone could attend that. Uh, it was believed to be the inner circle, and they also believed that those prayer meetings, if there was something going on at Basasa, it would be shared in that meeting, so you would become privy to a lot of things that were happening. Um, but it, it, people, it, it was aspirational. People wanted to attend that. Mm. Everybody mm. knew him by his first name. He wasn't Mr. Watson. He was Gavin, right down to the security guards. Everybody knew that they could approach him with his first name, but there was never a lack of respect from using that first name. When was the last interaction or the last time that you, you were with Gavin and you saw him? Uh, about two years ago. Oh, so, the, so it wasn't anything too recent. His mental health at that time, obviously, that was before all of the uh, state capture issues started coming up and Angelo Agritzi accusing him of all forms of bribery and corruption. If you talk about mental health, the man beamed, he boomed, he was commanding, he was a visionary. The one good thing that worked between him and Angelo Gritzi was he would have the vision, he would come up with phenomenal ideas sometime, and it was up to Angelo Gritzi to translate those ideas into reality. And Angelo was very practical that way. And I think that formed the basis of the union between them because he, um, he trusted Angelo and he knew that Angelo could deliver on that. And the other thing is that the sad thing is, is that um, the, the services that were offered by the Salsa were benchmarked. There never, ever had to be any bribery mm. because whatever they offered was superlative. You knew you were getting the very best and you always employed the very best people. Yeah. Obviously, you wanted Christians to join and there was a long line of 
of Christians who would give up their employment and take a more lowly employment in order just to get into Basasa, in order that they could work with him and be with this aspirational, very charismatic figure. You know, when he, he smiled, the whole world opened, and he never stopped smiling. So we look at the, the reports that are coming out, and it, it, there's the, the story that he called a prayer meeting um, on the Sunday morning before his death, the day before he died. Was this normal practice that you no. knew of, that, that the prayer no. meetings would take place on a weekend? I would, I would suggest, and sorry for interrupting you, no I would suggest this is very significant. He would call the occasional prayer meeting if something unusual was happening. They would have an all-night prayer session if things were happening in the country. But this was very unusual. And my gut and intuition suggests to me uh, Gavin was a person that espoused his own freedom. He was free with his ideas, free with where he was going. He was at liberty to do whatever he wanted. He had the cash to do it. And if he believed that, because he was due to testify the next day, if he believed that his freedom was going to be compromised in any way, it is possible that that would have brought about, brought this to a pinnacle. Yeah. So uh, I know there are many conspiracy theories about what happened, but it does look as if um, they were, he was leading up to a point. There was something happening. It was very unusual for him to call a prayer meeting. That would have raised a massive flag for me. Yeah, and, and, that, and that I think a lot of people are speaking to and asking, you know, why, why on a Sunday? Why leave your car there? Why? All the questions that are being asked right now, obviously it's all speculation and, and we need to let the Lord take its, its course. But just in terms of what you heard, and, and I think maybe this could be a question that people are asking, you know, was this an accident? accident? Was this suicide? The character you're describing to me was certainly not suicidal, even though you only had interaction with him two years ago. Well, um, it was he suicidal? The answer is, I never knew him as that. He was very bold and confident, and you always you, you got that certainty in his presence. You know, from a body language perspective, if you look someone in the face and they've got mobile features, you know you can trust him. You knew what Gavin was thinking by the way he moved his face and he spoke to you. This was completely out of order, which suggests the downward spiral. He was known for organizing prayer meetings if something critical was happening. And for a director's meeting a day before something like this happens, as I said, a massive flag. There's no way that I would have ignored this. And working in the mental health field, if I saw this with a client, I would immediately start to become suspicious and start putting in holds and interventions to monitor behavior to mm. support that person. Mm, mm. I, I, you're contributing to a book at the moment coming out shortly. And I think, if I'm not sure, is this the same book of, um, Adrian Besson is working on? I, Adrian Besson, yes. He's yeah. got a... It's a very compelling book because he's really done a cross-cut analysis of the entire Basas operations, and I've contributed to it. My interests have been the argument that this is a cult. And I said there were, there were several cultish elements in it, like the prayer meetings and the Holy Communion for which he had no qualifications. Yeah. Uh, he, he, you know, in the canon, somebody who's not a priest or a pastor does not give Holy Communion. He did. Uh, it was part of the ritual. And people waited for that. Yeah. So, um, um, no, I don't th think so. This is this was something out of the ordinary. It, it was a very compelling message, and somebody should have sat up and paid attention, and they didn't. Yeah, because I mean, I, you know, that is something interesting, and that's why I was asking, you know, about these the, the giving uh, giving out communion. Because I mean, a priest or a pastor. I mean, he, was he a priest or a pastor? Do you know that? No, he wasn't. He, he, no, he had no uh, uh, qualifications. That he, he was a staunch believer. He was a Christian. He lived the Christian principles. He quoted the Bible. He wasn't interested in academic theory. If he came to your office and he, you said something, he would quote at lip from the Bible, which he seemed to know off by heart. Um, he, so Christianity was central to his entire philosophy. Yeah. And you know, in terms of cults, cults dishonor the family unit. He never did that. There were no propaganda wars uh, inside the salsa. Um, cults have their own vocabulary. There was no vocabulary in, in Basasa. You could come and go as you wanted to. Cults have a, a fear or favor element. That didn't apply in uh, Basasa. There was a type of Camelot. Because if you've been to those premises, you had these extraordinary um, landscaped 
uh, gardens with little secret rooms and geese and birds and animals. It was, it was a pleasure to walk from one unit to the other. And a mashi course, I know of no company in this country that has anything that could, would, could be its pair. Yeah. The only time I've seen that is something similar in the States. Mm-hmm. And the other argument from the perspective of, of Coles is McDonald's, for instance, has got its own university, which teaches the way you do things around here. And there's a whole new movement in companies where they, they have the uniform, they have ways we do things. That does not make it a cult. But as I said to you, the prayer rituals suggested cultish elements, and they did seem to be type of cultish behavior between the directors. Yeah, it's quite, you know, I, I go back to the, the, the suicide issue, because in Christianity, suicide is something that is not done. It's not something that, um, that the Christianity would believe in, and that, in fact, is, is, is quite, it's quite well known. So, I mean, if he was such a devout Christian... Would that really be the route you'd go? Leanne, I think, you know, I find that it's stronger with the, the Catholic religion rather than just the overall okay. uh, Christian denominations. But his belief was so profound that he believed that if he d- died, he would go to heaven and things would come all right. Yeah. So he's, 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 the power of his belief system would have overridden the suicide yeah. and he would have felt he would be doing it in the, the best interest of everybody. Does, you know, he, he, he walked away from the Zonda Commission. He could have gone there and questioned a lot of the things that Angelo Gritzi said. He didn't do that. And I think that he felt cornered. Uh, I'm, as, a, as, a, as I say, a mental health practitioner, all the flags were there. This man was in a downward spiral yeah. and, uh, and nobody was picking up the signals. Denise, did you, when you heard all of these revelations coming out from Angelo Agritti during uh, his testimony, were you surprised at the, at the, at the goings on at Versace? Seeing as in that you were involved by, you know, mentally assessing a lot of the staff there. <laughs> well, what is interesting is that, remember we had a, we, we did about a thousand consultations a year, and it's varied from coaching to counselling to, to referrals to hospitals, etc. Um, staff used to come to us and tell us what was happening, but it sounded so anecdotal. We never got the full picture because always they were afraid of saying uh, a lot of things, and, and so we would. We, it was guesswork. When I heard Angelo Gritzi's testimony, it was a complete revelation. There were things that we we certainly did not know. Um, and what took place in the upper echelons at the headquarters in the campus, we certainly weren't privy to. But staff did talk to us, and I felt that when they got rid of us of the campus, it was because they finally realized that the staff were sharing things with us, and we had become a threat because we were privy to too much information. Mm. Well, very interesting to get some uh, background uh, information about the, the goings-on at Busasa. And this is a story that is certainly going to be looked into quite boldly and a uh, lot of people wanting some answers on all of this. But uh, Dr. Denise Bjorkman, we thank you very much for your time. Uh, Dr. Bjorkman is a former Busasa service provider sharing with us her, her memories of Gavin Watson and the culture in the Busasa company. Let's take a break. We'll see you after this.